Well, good morning, church. We're going to continue in our series of Surprised by Joy. And as we look at this story in the gospel, I love the gospel stories. Written over 2,000 years ago, but the writers of these gospel stories have a way of pulling us right into them to, to think that we're right here now with Jesus reliving these situations. So I'm going to ask you this morning to come with me as we journey to Jerusalem. We're going to be inside the walls of the city of Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. And we're going to hear the story of an outcast, an invalid who has been hurting for 38 years, weary and waiting for someone to heal him. And then he's surprised by joy that comes from Jesus and what he did with his life. I invite you, if you would, to turn to John, the fifth chapter, verse 1, and listen and receive the word of the Lord. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up on a sleeping mat. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing like that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well. So stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was time for one of the great festivals of the Jewish faith. And people from all over Israel had come up to Jerusalem to celebrate in the holy city. Those who came from Galilee had walked over 65 miles through the rough road along the Jordan River all the way into Jericho. The procession was more like a parade that included the extended family, aunts and uncles, cousins, grandmas and grandpas. They spent the night in Jericho because they still had the strenuous 15-mile arduous climb up into the city of Jerusalem. And they would walk that robber-infested road from Jericho to Jerusalem. But as the people got closer to the great city, 
the excitement began to grow and they began to sing. Choirs formed spontaneously in the crowds as they climbed up to Jerusalem singing the Psalms of Ascent. And you can read about it that in the history of the Scriptures. People would do that as they entered into the city of Jerusalem. By the time they reached the city, the festivities were well underway. Singing and dancing and clapping of hands. Real lively stuff, just like here at Living Hope Church. Well, maybe not the dancing. But that was how the Jews celebrated and worshipped. They would have times of teaching and times of sacrifice and all kinds of fellowship. It was a very exciting time. Meanwhile, in another part of Jerusalem, there was a place called the Pool of Bethesda. It was located just inside the Sheep Gate, the entrance into the city through which the sheep were brought on the way to be sacrificed to the temple. Archaeological evidence shows us that the pool was shaped like a trapezoid, four uneven sides. It was somewhere between 165 feet to 200 feet wide and about 300 feet long, a large pool. And it was divided into two pools with a partition in the center. On one end of the pool had broad steps with landings where Jerusalem pilgrims would come for their ritual bath called the mikvah to purify themselves before they went into worship in the temple. On the other end was a reservoir that had fresh water flowing through it. Mineral springs ran underneath the pool and every so often they would bubble up and they would stir the water in the pool. The people attributed the phenomenon to an angel of the Lord. And they believed that the first person to step into the troubled waters would be healed of whatever disease they had. So those who were blind or lamed or paralyzed would huddle around this pool under the colonnades day after day after day, pinning their hope on the chance that they might be the first one to get into the waters and be healed. Isn't it interesting that Jesus took time out from the festival to go down to the pool of Bethesda? It was a place packed full of people with the most incredible needs. You know, I've had three different kinds of major surgeries. Children's Hospital in Buffalo. I've been in Pittsburgh and the Cleveland Clinic. And here at Wilson Hospital. And every time I've gone for surgeries, I've realized that there are incredible needs of people around me who are more desperate in worse situations. You can imagine that pool of all those people looking for help. Earlier in the service, I asked if you would be willing to name something you gave up hoping for because it no longer, because it, it, it took so long that you gave up hope that anything was going to finally happen. And this is what some people have shared. Norma. I had given up hope to finding significant relief from, de from depression. But six years ago, circumstances took me to yet another new doctor. And finally, after 20 plus years, we found the right combination of medications. Praise Jesus. Todd writes a friend who had a drug problem for 10 years. He finally was arrested, hit bottom, end up in a Christian drug rehab. He has been drug-free and a follower of Jesus for the past 18 years. Praise God. Beverly, I wanted to be a nurse, was ready after 
graduating high school in 1957, but it didn't happen until 1975 when I finally received my nurse's cap. And Sharon writes, my mother-in-law, I think, gave up on us having grandkids. But it was only three years after we were married. But she was so ready. Has there been something in your life that you have longed for such a long time and you gave up hope because you didn't think it was going to happen. Jesus walked around the pool of Bethesda and he fixed his eyes on one particular person. This man who was lying on a mat. He had been paralyzed for 38 years. As the man laid on a mat, year after year, his limbs had shriveled from disuse. And year after year, his hope had shriveled as well. And Jesus walked over to the man and he asked him a very unusual question. Do you want to be made well? What an odd question. The man might have answered such a strange question with a sarcastic answer. Well, what do you think? You think I have people carry me here every day? And they drop me off and then they come back at night and they pick me up. And for 38 years I've been continuing to do this and come and lie beside this pool. But instead, he answered Jesus' question by expressing his frustration. What does it matter if I want to be healed? It's useless anyway. Every time the water stirs, I'm so disabled, there's no way that I can get into the water first. Everybody else is looking out for themselves, pushing and shoving to get into the water first because they have their own problems, their own situations that they want to be healed from. Jesus responded to the man's frustration with an amazing command. Get up. Pick up your bed and walk. And just as amazing, the man did. He stood up, he picked up his bed, and for the first time ever, he left the pool on his own Two legs. Miracle from God. Can you imagine his disbelief and the joy that he must have had? The scriptures tell us that he headed straight to the temple because he would be wanting to go to the first festival he had been ever able to attend in 38 years. You see, because if you're an invalid, if you're an outcast, if you're blind or you're lame or you're paralyzed, you weren't allowed to come into the temple. But the man decided that's where he was headed. And he's on his way and he runs into a group of Pharisees. Now remember that the Pharisees were deeply religious people who believed that the faithful showed their love for God by adhering strictly to the letter of the law. They were so intent on following every jot and tittle of the law that they developed incredibly detailed procedures to ensure that they didn't inadvertently break the law. The law says... Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Well, how do you keep it holy? Don't do any work. What constitutes work? Carrying a burden. Does carrying a bed constitute a burden? If someone's on the bed, no. But if you are carrying just the bed, yes. So there were the Pharisees self-righteously watching to make sure no one was breaking the law. And along comes this man. You've 
can imagine he's got a little bounce in his step and he's walking towards the temple, his pallet under his arm. And they stop him saying, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Even after the man told them that he had been healed, they couldn't celebrate with him because they were too wrapped up with the rules to enjoy God's grace. Ouch. How often do we refuse to celebrate someone else's healing in life? For 38 years, this man lay on his mat. He heard the jubilant singing as pilgrims swarmed into the city. For 38 years, he had longed to be in the temple, to join the faithful as they celebrated the high, holy days. But all he knew instead was the pain of being an outcast, an ostracized person. So the first thing he did when he was healed, he got up to go to the temple, a place he thought he would never see again in his life. And there he met the man who healed him. And Jesus said, I've been looking for you. That's a beautiful thing about the Christian faith. God is constantly seeking and reaching out to human beings. Jesus went on to say to him, you are well physically now, but your healing is not complete. Stop sinning and be spiritually healed or something even worse is going to happen to you. We don't know what the man's sin was. We're not told. But it seems like it was a serious sin, not a garden variety kind of weakness. Jesus commands him to stop sinning the verb is in the present imperative form, suggesting that the man is continuing to sin. It's not just a slip-up or a single occurrence. It has been a way of life. And Jesus tells him the consequence if he doesn't stop sinning. Something worse may happen to you. You might ask, what could be worse than being crippled for 38 years? How about if you were totally separated from God forever? That's what hell is like. That may have been what Jesus was referring to. Stop sinning. We don't know that the sin was directly related to the man's physical problems. But what Jesus does say is this, that if this man or any of us is it going to enjoy the wholeness that Jesus wants for him or for us, he has to deal with all the issues that may have paralyzed him as a human being. So you see, the story of the outcast is a parable for us because God just doesn't heal shriveled bodies. He can also heal shriveled lives. Morning after morning, this man had been brought to the place of hope only to have his hopes dashed over and over and over and over again. And after a while, that eats at a person's outlook and energy until they simply give up and settle for being shriveled. 
shriveled abilities, shriveled emotions, shriveled relationships, shriveled hopes. When Jesus asked the man if he wanted to be healed, the man's answer was filled with emotions. There was disappointment and anger, bitterness, resentment, envy. How can I be healed when everyone's focused on their own problems and no one will help me with mine? Friends, we were not created to be filled with these emotions. There is something bigger and better that God has in mind for each of us. It's easy to get caught up in the negative attitude, easy to settle into dependence upon others, easy to become bitter and shriveled. Sometimes it's easier to stay beaten down than it is to stand up and walk. And so Jesus challenged the man with that very deep question. Do you really want to be made well. Jesus knew that change is scary. It's scary to take responsibility for what is wrong in your life. It's frightening to stand up and take those first tentative steps toward getting well. Sometimes it's easier to stay shriveled up because life at least is predictable and you understand what you're dealing with. When you have lived without joy or hope for a long, long time, it's frightening to dare to hope again. Change, even good change, means that things will never be the same again. And that is scary. And so Jesus comes to each of us and he says, I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. Do you want to get well? Then stand up and walk. Stop sinning and let's move on with life. Pray with Lord Jesus, give us the courage to recognize and claim your healing power where each of us needs you in our own lives. Lord, it's, it's easy to look out at others and see what their situation is, but this morning, God, you're, you're calling each of us to examine Where is our life shriveled up? Where do we continue to sin? Where is there brokenness? Where have we lost hope? Lord, restore our wholeness and our joy so that as we sing this next song, we continue to sing, I found you in the middle of my mess. And you've been there all along, God. Arms open, hearts open wide to you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you continue to seek after us. No matter what has happened. And Lord, I especially pray for those who feel like they're on a mat and no one can help them. 
just so weighed down. Touch them, Lord. Draw them close to you. Lord, this morning I want to pray that we as a church, Living Hope Church, save us from being more consumed with our festivities in this place than being, than being willing to go out to the pools of Bethsaida in our communities so that we would seek out the hurting people of your world and in our communities. Oh God, and we pray that we would never lose sight of the incredible grace you can work upon shriveled lives. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.